I'm Michael, and this is Mache Darnell. Uh, we've been here about two years, two and a half ish, um, and uh, we're elders here, and we serve at Mom's Pantry. So, uh, I'm going to read scripture for you this morning. All right, if you guys are able, will you rise for the reading of God's word? We're going to be reading from Matthew 2, verses 13 through 15. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, guys. So we're officially post-Christmas, right? Here we are, plowing into the new year. So appreciated Pastor Lenny's message last week. It was just beautiful. fantastic. And you words. can catch it. It was. Yeah. It was beautiful. Get online if you, so good. Yeah, you can weren't here. You can find it on YouTube and, and watch it if you didn't get a chance to. It was just fantastic. Yeah. But sometimes the time post-Christmas can be... A little bit of a letdown. Have you noticed that? Like your guests go home, which I guess sometimes that can be great. Like that's a good <laughs> moment, right, when the guests leave. But sometimes you wish they could stay. Sometimes you might wish that the lights could stay up. Okay, show of hands, who has their Christmas decorations down already? Yes. Down? Wow. Okay, good. Anybody still have them up? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right. Anybody just didn't yes. do it this year? And proudly no. they raised their hands. All right. Yes. Nope, okay. It's, yes. it's easier to just leave them up. And See, that's what off I wanted to do. I wanted the to just leave on them up there November. this year come because on. then it's going to come that <laughs> right, quick, right? Exactly. But sometimes we miss it. So now, you know, the tree is gone. The lights are down. I'm trying to get my eating back under control again. Yeah, it's not yeah. like, you know, cookie and cake, cookies and cake for, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner anymore. We got to have some vegetables every once in a while. Yeah. So this is that time, right? This is the time when we kind of rein it in a little bit. I read a story this week about a little, uh, little boy who was in, in his family and they were pulling down all the decorations and you know, the, the nativity scent went away and all the lights came down and the tree, of course, if you have a live tree, at some point it becomes a fire hazard and you've got to drag that thing to the front curb, right? Because otherwise it's going to you know, combust in your living room if you live here. So the family dragged the tree out and they put it down by the trash bins and the little boy is just more than he can manage and he just falls apart and cries. He just sits down by the tree, grabs a hold of it and says, please don't go, please don't go. <laughs> just crying for this tree. Don't let Christmas go so quickly, right? Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's just too much for us. Yeah. It's yeah. tough to see it pass at times. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, uh, as we step into the new year, um, series that, uh, that we're going to spend a couple weeks with talking is, as you see on the screen, on the move. And uh, simplicity of that is, is what is common for this uh, time of the year is that we get a chance to reorient and uh, focus our attention. And I think one of the things that, that we find ourselves uh, at, amiss with is our purpose. Um, it is amazing how quickly we can lose a sense of purpose or be off purpose. And when we're talking about being part of the kingdom of God as followers of Christ, there is a very distinct purpose that we have. And we dare not lose sight of that purpose. Um, the church at large as a historical missional movement, uh, it's, it's not news to anybody. It's struggling. Uh, that, that was... The case before the pandemic, um, the, especially in America, the evangelical church has been consistently on a decline for the last 30, 40 years. If we're not careful, there might be an interpretation of that, of an assumption that the church of the living God is somehow dead or dying. That is not the case. Uh, our culture... Um, has had its influence on people and even how we've structured or organized or labeled that which is called the church. I mean, you know it, right? Many would raise their hands. I mean, they, they say statistically that we've been, we're, we're well into 75, 80% of America identifies themselves 
with the raised hand saying, yes, I'm a Christian. You do not have to look very far because that would mean that literally every eight out of ten people that you run into are followers of Jesus Christ, born again believers. How many believe that's been the, that's your experience? Are you experiencing that? Um, and I'm talking about not the kind of Christians that the world identifies as Christians, but the kind that Scripture actually reveals are born again believers. Um, nationally, they they uh, stats are are telling us in the last several years that that number is more has been more accurately maybe. 30 to 40 percent, but really when you really drill down to actually Bible believing those that would believe the scriptures, you are now down into single digits. Now, um, that is not new. It, it, I mean, obviously, how many know that's just obvious? You just look at the world, you look at the, the political landscape, you look at the way people vote and policies, things that matter. It's like, come on, not 80 percent. Um, the church is struggling. Um, I, I, find, uh, I find it an interesting challenge that we sit with in this time and place. Um, I can tell you this, it is not time to be discouraged. It's, chi- it's time to get in the fight. And, uh, and I think it just says, like, we're going to, well, since he said, come on, so I got to obey. Um, I don't have Richard, by the way, I'm assuming he's watching, or your brother here is... Uh, uh, we'd be praying for him, but uh, we'll use we'll use Todd instead. I here, here's the here's the reality. I think we've been waiting for the church uh, to wake up, and here's part of my concern. Just honestly, y'all, I think we've been assuming that the people that we thought need to wake up were part of the church, and they're not. They may identify as being churchgoers. But again, the church of the living God are those that are born again followers of Jesus Christ. And so if we're sitting around waiting for the church to wake up when they're not even part of the church and and, and instead of saying, wait a second, let's go and do and be what the actual church is called to be and do. And now we start getting in the game in a way that's going to matter where we do what we're called to do, and that's to permeate our community, to permeate the relationships that we have, not with social agenda, but with the love and the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so I think I think we are we are amiss if we're sitting around waiting For them to come to us when the very essence of the call of the church is to go to them. Like the the very essence of us is to be sent ones. And the last thing we need to be thinking is isolationism. The last thing we need is is home, what do they call it? Homesteading or or whatever. Like, Like what we need to be is to be that in and among our everyday places, right? So, so there is a sense where, okay, like the church wakes up, but, but the, the church wakes up to the reality of what we're called uh, to be and do, which is really a, a, a church on the move. She's got to find her. I think there's a sense where, uh, just like the old compass thing, right? Old metaphor. Um, the moment you lose your true north um, is the moment you are going to be off course. And you may think you're heading the right direction. How many know there's a difference between magnetic north and true north? Come on, uh, military folks and scouters. Um, there is a difference. The true north is a, is a set geographical location that, that does not move. The magnetic thing, and that's been the problem, I think, for the, maybe the church history, has been like, well, we've got to move with the times. How's that working out? Like seriously, the moment we, we made a decision, you know what, we, we, we need to do more and make more adjustments and compromise in order to relate with the world. Um, the assumption was that if we do that, if we compromise, that we're going to win hearts over. The, the, only, the only way to win hearts is the true north, and that's Jesus. It's mm-hmm. Jesus Christ himself. The unvarnished truth of who Jesus is. Amen? Amen. Um, 
So, uh, so I say we find our, our, our find our true north. And um, I, Pastor Long gave me this uh, back. Uh, it's beautiful. It says on the back, mm-hmm. and I love this. Um, Be strong and courageous for the Lord, my God, Amen. is with thee. Church, be strong in the Lord. Amen. 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 Yes. Let it be. That's right. Colossians has uh, has been one of the the, one of our favorite. I think I think for really for church history um, has been one of the the great inspirations of of New Testament writing for worship. And I want to give you this because if you're if you're questioning at all, maybe you've been sitting here and you've been attending church or. you're hearing the, the, the sound of the voice and you still are a question about getting it. Look, at, look with me at, at Romans, at Col- Colossians 1, just real quickly, and you'll see it on the screen here. I want you to, I want you to read this with me, if you don't mind. He, he, and it's Jesus, right? He is the image of the, the invisible God, God the firstborn, firstborn of all creation. creation. For by Him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. him. And He, he is, is before all things, and in, in him, him all things hold, hold together. together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. Come on, one more. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. One more time, Amen. please. We got it. We want to really get that one right. Lord, please, in the spirit of worship, let's say it together. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Amen. 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 It's Jesus. That's right. Like, who are we following? Jesus, right? That's right. And that is not some kind of cheerleader chant. Like, who are we going to follow? Jesus. <laughs> right? <laughs> no. That's exactly right. There's an authority <laughs> in it. I'm a follower of Jesus. Jesus. Amen. 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 Who in all the fullness of God. As members yeah. of the church, we are invited, right, to join up, to yes. get involved with the abundant life and the mission of Jesus Christ. Amen. And when we say that we are part of a historical missional movement, what we mean by that is that everything that began in Acts, right? In Acts 2, with the birth of the church, when they were seeking the Lord in the upper room and God sent the Holy Spirit to transform and empower those believers that were there. For thousands of years after that point, the church continued to grow and build. And yes, there have been problems because people have been involved with it all this time, right? The church is always going to have issues because I'm here, because we're here, because people are involved with it. But there's been so much good, incalculable good has been done for all of those years of the hospitals that have been built, the marginalized that have been helped, the prisoners that have been set free, the people who have been healed and delivered. All of that is the outflow of that event the coming of Christ, his death and resurrection, and the coming of the Spirit, that's what we're part of. Yes. We're part of that. We're part of that movement, right? That's a winning team. Exactly. (laughs) It's not about being loyal to certain outcomes or to a particular belief system, but our loyalty is firmly fixed on the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's Jesus Christ that we are loyal to, right? Amen. And for whatever reason, and I I love it that you uh, brought this up this morning, Darnell, that... uh, the Lord has chosen to use us, right? That we're, we're, we get to be part of it. And for whatever reason, he has chosen that we will participate with him in his work in the world. Thank God. I mean, what better thing is there than to work alongside the God of the universe for his good in the earth? That is what we get to be part of, right? <laughs> so good. So we each have collective responsibility, as you've already brought up, and our individual responsibility to continue to keep our focus Upon our true north, and I, I love that, I love that metaphor for what we're talking about this morning. If my eyes are firmly fixed on Jesus, in our prayer call last night, Jim brought up the song, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. The things of earth kind of get dim, right? In the light of his glory and grace, 
Lord, let that be the focus of the church from now on, that we would hone our vision upon you so clearly that you are what we see. May that be one of the wonderful implications of following Jesus is that he will deliver us. And he certainly has delivered us. If we're in Christ, we are delivered from sin, and that is done and set and forever. But there are times in our lives, perhaps you found this, as I certainly have, that I get off course, and I get distracted by a myriad of things, and sometimes it's sinful, and sometimes it's not. But he will deliver us and help us with those course corrections that we need as we walk alongside him, right? He is faithful to deliver us day after day as well as the full deliverance from sin, because we're not finished yet. We're in that sanctification process that will take place throughout our entire lives, or we're becoming more and more and more like Christ. So we are none of us stuck today. We are not abandoned. He is with us to deliver us, and we must never forget that one of the primary revelations of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ is that of deliverer. Praise God for that. So we look at our text this morning. I know it was a brief, just kind of a brief little, little snapshot of Joseph and Mary and Jesus. And the context that this is happening in is basically the, the Magi have left. They came and they brought their gifts and they worshiped Jesus. And that was uh, just a beautiful revelation of Christ to the Gentiles, right? Because they were Gentiles. They were not Jewish Magi. They were from another country. And they come and they, they see baby Jesus and they realize that here he is, the king of the Jews, right? So verse 13, now that they departed, the Magi had left. And behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. You see Joseph in this, in this moment and uh, wow, what, a, what an amazing example of a, of a believer that he is for us. We see him uh, hear the word of the Lord. The angel says to him in the dream, rise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt And remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. So Jesus' life uh, is very eventful from the very beginning, right? He he, uh, has to, through his his caregivers, he is going to be taken from Bethlehem all the way to Egypt, which is about 90 miles. The border of Egypt is about 90 miles from Bethlehem. And we see Joseph just willing to, okay, if you say so, here we go. And it says that they leave by night. So we have this sense that he wakes from this dream. Okay, time to go. Pack up. We're going to hit the road. He packs up Mary and the baby, and they head to Egypt. And Joseph is willing in this moment to abandon what is most familiar. And we should remember that, that he probably had been working to some degree. They think perhaps that by the time the Magi came to see Jesus, that he was actually somewhere around two years old, maybe a year and a half or, or two years. We don't know exactly. But he had been supporting them, so he's going to have to leave all of that However, he was caring for the family. Thankfully, they think that the gifts of the Magi probably financed the trip to Egypt. So God provides, right? He's always providing what is needed. In usual ways. Exactly. So not only does he abandon what is familiar, but he follows God's leading. And we see a quick response. Like, this is just obedience. Quick, quick, quick obedience. He didn't have the, you know, the, the mental board meeting. He didn't overthink it. He just got up and did it. Seeking first the kingdom. And, and I love it that we see, you know, God's direction in this moment was very clear. He says, rise, take the child and his mother and flee. Go now. So we have this direct word. And he responds. So the family travels to Egypt. We might ask ourselves, what did they think of when they thought of Egypt? Mm-hmm. Well, you know the history from Exodus. They would have known the history from Exodus. Yep. Egypt, typically in the Bible, is a symbol of idolatry, right? The flesh, the enemy of God, bondage, slavery, the opposite of what is good and what God had for his people. So it's remarkable that God would send them to Egypt. You know the story from Exodus that God uh, called Moses to go and uh, to, to rescue the people and to deliver them out of this bondage and oppression because they had been over 400 years in Egypt, growing, multiplying, but they were being oppressed by the Pharaoh and he was turning them into slaves and having them build, build these huge cities for his glory 
And God heard their cries because the people were crying out because they were being oppressed, because they were being treated badly, and the Egyptians were making their lives bitter with hard labor. And you know the story too, where the Pharaoh looked at all of the Israelites and said, hmm, there's just too many of them. We need to start evening out those numbers. And so he would have the, his guards kill the babies that were born to the Israelites. If they were a male baby, they were to be killed. And that was the genesis of Moses. So for 400 years pass, and God sends Moses to deliver them. And we've seen, though, that what happened to them when they were in Egypt, and we made up this word just, just specially for this morning. For this morning. The Egyptification of God's people. That yes. what it has, right? I know it's good, right? I love it. Yeah. It's going to go in the dictionary for 23. Egyptification. Yeah. That's like good five, job. When was the last time I did a five syllable word? That was word? very good. No, wow. it's uh, excellent. Sorry. But it really describes what happened that they, they were there happen. and they were working, but they also had been sort of infected. Yeah by the yeah. life that was all caught up in Egypt. Yeah, yeah, which became the, you know, that became their norm. We know how the story plays out. They go to the wilderness, <laughs> right. they, they get delivered, right? They get delivered physically out of Egypt. But their mentality, their thoughts, their ideas, their ethos, the way they do things, still very much Egypt. Forty years, God dealt with that Egyptification. Right. I think if you use, how many times do we have to use it to make it an official word? Just three. Three times. So I think good. we did it. Yep. All right, yeah. we're there. <laughs> Pro- they're, they're, the propensity, I mean, even when you think about just going to that, connecting with, with that part of history. They kept wanting to go back to Egypt. They did. Like, what is they that sure in human did. nature yeah. that wants to keep going back? To that which God has already delivered us out of. I'm preaching now. You are. Because yeah. that is like this tendency. Like what in the world? But it happens and it has happened throughout all of history. So we, we, we don't want to miss this. We all have a propensity in ourselves. To want to go back and to be tethered to where we came from. So we really just remember what was good about it. Is when they were thinking about how great Egypt was, yes. it was, oh, the food. We missed yes. the food. Yes, the good old days, yeah. right? It was so much easier. Really we got not... food for free. It's like, well, not really. Yeah. You paid for that food. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, uh, I, I'll just I'll say it. I, I, I think the enemy uses that. I think that is one of the tricks of the enemy is deceive us in order to keep us tethered to the past. That's right. We do it in the, in the modern church. We're like, oh, why can't we do it that way like we used to do it? We're like, yeah. because that was yesterday. We're in 20, and now we're not talking about principles and God's word, but folks, it is 2023. It is not the same. There is, dear Lord, right? Nothing is the same of what it was. This is what we get to be anchored to, and it's Jesus himself. Like, that's the part that never, never changes. Anyway, so just the significance of of Egypt is is absolutely, uh, Matthew is a gospel writer, wants us to catch this. It is not uh, just by chance that, that God sends Mary and Joseph to Egypt. This has already been brought up and you probably already started going there in your mind. It, the, the significance of, of being sent into Egypt advances past the Egyptification. It, it, it's it's, it's to, to really remake, to fulfill scripture and remake history. Not by erasing it or like modern uh, uh, modern writers do, right? Um, not to erase or, or, or change the facts, but here's what Jesus get, does. Here's what God does through Jesus Christ. He goes back into Egypt, back to where the Israelites ultimately got it all wrong. And he goes back and he redeems it and takes and reestablishes. And we're going to rewrite this and there's not going to be the same ending. Where the miserable, not miserable people, the people became miserable in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. He's going to once and for all going to bring deliverance to the world through Jesus, his son. And so he does this to fulfill scripture and to remake history, to bring Jesus, say it with me, to bring Jesus out of Egypt. So what does that mean? Out of Egypt, I called my son out of bondage. 
out of bondage. I called my son and Eva, as it were, to give him a new name, to give him a name. And his name is revealed in this account that we just had here, that he's revealed as our deliverer. Amen. Amen. Well, I thought that was just a little nativity story. This is so consequential. And if you've missed it in Matthew 2, you've been missing the, the, what we get to see as a remaking of history and the reality that Jesus is our deliverer. Amen. 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 Matthew is making a direct reference to the book of Hosea, one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. And if you haven't read that book lately, it's, it's yeah, it's wild. God essentially tells the prophet to go and marry a woman who's struggling, a woman who has sold herself because she is a representation of his people, the faithlessness that the people of God had demonstrated toward him, the people of the covenant that had turned away from his life and his love toward them and followed after the idols of the land. So God tells Hosea to go and marry her and then have children by her. And in one of the passages, it's 11, 11, 1, Hosea, Hosea 11, 1 says, When Israel, the, like the voice of God speaking through the prophet, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. So we see Jesus remaking reenacting history and that this trip to Egypt for Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus is absolutely to fulfill scripture. And we'll see in the gospel of Matthew over and over again, he explains how Jesus' personal history was a a repeat of several aspects of Israel's national history as well to show Jesus as the perfect fulfillment of everything that has happened up until this point and to his coming. But this reference of out of Egypt, I've called my son. It's a reference to the the people of Israel who, despite the love of God, they had continued in idolatry and yet God again and again delivered them. And it points to this day where Jesus has come and there is one deliverer who will come once and for all is what they were all looking toward, right? The deliverer who would come and settle it forever. Our Savior. Another place in the Old Testament, David wrote about God being his deliverer frequently. Psalm 18, verse 2, David says these words, when God had given him rest from his enemies and from Saul, it says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my deliverer. Yeah. God is my deliverer. Uh, the, the, old, the, the Hebrew word there is palat. And um, mm. it's not, uh, we, we want to we understand that word as in associated with being brought out. Like, like to be extricated. Deliverance, I, I think it's possible that it's been reduced down to this clinical uh, word or uh, even, a, even a, a, a theological or heady word. That, that misses the, the, the reality of what it is. Jesus is the palat. He's the one that has extricated us out of. Mm-hmm. And he didn't, just, he didn't just leave us there, leave us in, a, in, a, in a, um, uh, an existential sense, but he truly delivered us Amen. out of the domain of darkness. That's really palat. Right. Amen. Just so encourage us to spend a little time in Psalm 18 this week, yeah, and uh, it's it's so it's just such a beautiful a beautiful psalm. And David recounts how God delivered him. And sometimes I think maybe, and maybe it's just me. I don't think so. But sometimes I think that God is like because I'm a Christian, God is contractually obligated to help me. Right? Okay, I've taken yes, I've received Jesus. So now you have to help me. You know, because you said you would, not because you really want to. Right. Sometimes we get these ideas, you know, that maybe God loves us because he said he loves everyone, mm. but he doesn't really like me. Mm. Sometimes we might think that he, he, you know, he saves us through gritted teeth. They're like, oh, fine. All right, you need me again? Really? <laughs> really? Sure. 
But I love this psalm because it like turns that whole thing on its head. David shows psalm God 18. as deeply emotionally invested in yeah. his deliverance. Like <laughs> God is angry, it says, at the enemies of his people. <laughs> God rips heaven open to come down to deliver <laughs> his child, right? Mm. And that's not just David, not just because David was his favorite. That's for each single one of us. Every single one of us, God will deliver us in that way, right? (laughs) Tear open heaven. I mean, he describes God with like, you know, like angry and snorting and like, it just, it's, you've got to read it. You've got to read it this week. (laughs) And he goes through this whole thing of describing how God comes and saves. And then he says this, one of my favorite verses ever. He says, verse 19 of chapter 18 of Psalms, it says, he rescued me because he delighted in me. Yes. Imagine that. He rescued me because he delighted God delights in, in you. Me. Yes. God delights in you. Wow. He's not just putting up with you. He delights in you. <laughs> you are the joy of his heart. Mm. You thrill him. He loves you like that. Yeah. He loves me like that. I don't know why, because I know me. But that's what he says. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Just let that sit there for a moment, right? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can receive your love today. Nothing we have earned, nothing that we can change. It will never change your love for us. Mm. Thank you. Later, when Jesus was presenting his ministry in Luke chapter 4 when he gets the scroll and he reads the passage of Isaiah. Two times he says, I have been been sent, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, I am anointed to what? Proclaim liberty to the captives, Right. right? To speak liberty, to set at liberty all those who are oppressed. Jesus is about the delivering business, right? Yeah. It's like his, his essence. It's, it's the, the, <laughs> Amen. The, the, not, not just, uh, uh, again, what he does, but it's who he is. That's right. Deliver. So when we worship, we worship. He's our delivering God. Amen. He doesn't leave the, the same that he found us. Um, this, this story uh, this is, is, this story is just so perfect and so beautifully... Uh, uh, orchestrated by, by God, by sending Mary Joseph, baby the, with the child, into Egypt. But it's the, the focus is not, in fact, we, we spent a little time doing some research and what historians have said was the activity that Jesus, the, that family would have had during the time in Egypt. And it's just, it's as random as, except for the fact that you can go to Egypt right now through a travel website and you can follow <laughs> right. the step of, Egypt, of Jesus while in Egypt. Who knew that? For $5,000, you can go to all the different places that Jesus went. Amazing what man's come up with, right? Yeah. So here's where the God actually shines the spotlight. Not on what Jesus did in Egypt, but the fact that he went out of Egypt. And it wasn't just out to go nowhere. It was to go back to the promised land, to go back to Israel, right? So that's the, that's the journey out of Egypt in order to be restored to God's provision of the promise, all the promises that God has given us. So following Jesus is not only our way out of Egypt, but it is also how to stay out of Egypt. And this is potentially where we miss it so often in the church today. A person might come in, like any one of the sound of my voice came in and said, I'm ready to accept Christ as Savior and Savior. And maybe they stopped there and they they didn't go Savior and Lord. Um, But then then the, 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 the thought was, I get to I get to have this on my resume that I'm a Christian and still live in the world as it were, as it was that I was delivered out of. And so we try and do life here while still claiming an identity in Christ. And the truth is, this is what we've been delivered out of while we are still in it. And this is what can blow our mind. Existentially, 
We have been delivered, but in the physical sense, we are very much present in this world. And guess what? That was always God's intent. And we never need to fear being in the world when we are in Christ. Yeah, but Chris, it's getting so bad. He's the one who came into Egypt and delivered us out of. He came in and remade history. Um, and I, I think it, it, it really, in a summary sense, it's about a readiness to leave and it's about a commitment to follow. But a commitment that says, I'm going to follow Jesus and I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop and I'm not going to get off point no matter how bad it is. I'm going to follow Jesus. And uh, it poses the question as we just uh, come to a closing thoughts here with us together, if you would. And I think it just it just seems befitting for part of our, our um, I saved a little water for you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, the, oh, the cost I, cuts at the church are just really, <laughs> sorry about thank that. Thank you. I, uh, Go ahead. I, I, you can have a little. Go ahead, okay, otherwise okay. I'm going to drink it. You, you should. Okay, fine. I'll spill um, it. <laughs> what does is, what is your Egypt look like? Um, but here's the other question. What does your deliverance look like? Think about it with me for a minute. Um, uh, any uh, Back to the Future fans? Yeah, come on, 80s. Yes. Thank you, Mache. All right. You remember the movie like a, uh, see, even our young generation. Thank you, Charmaine, for bringing yeah. that. Yeah, that's good. Um, you know, the, the, the story, it, it, it's, it's, it's really kind of a fascinating story, and it's probably something we've all thought about, and you, how many movies have been done about the idea of time travel, right? Oh, yeah. And being able to go back. Yes. And the, the thing popped out at me when I, was, when I was like, you know, Marty goes back because he, 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 he messed it up. There was a, a conversation, a thing that he wasn't supposed to do, and it affected the future because he went back. And now the children... He wasn't, even, he wasn't even born, so he had to go back and fix, go back to the future, as it were. And so I, um, I just remind us, this is, this is the work that God does when he delivers us. Um, there is nothing beyond his remaking Amen. in our lives. Amen. Like nothing. Amen. And you're sitting here in 2023, and you're like, yeah, but I've, so much time has passed. Hear the word of the Lord. It is never ever, ever too late for what God can do. And I, I hear Amen. testimony after testimony of what God has done. So we're sitting here today and you're like, look at the things that you're still tethered to, the things that you're still bound to in this present life or, or paradigms that like, this is the way I've always done it and I don't think I want to change. And, and at the end of the day, you know that God is calling you out. Into what? Into an abundant life in Him. Into an abundant life. I'll tell you what Egypt, um, living and staying in Egypt starts looking like. It also includes a mindset that says, I'm still thinking like a person that was in bondage, in poverty and oppressed. We embrace the reality of a deliverance that God has not only delivered me, as it were, my, my being, my soul, as you, you said, sweetheart, at the beginning, but that he has delivered me from an old mindset into an embrace of the abundance of God, which could be said in simplicity like this. It is unlimited possibilities of what God could do even Today It means we wake up every morning. It means that person that has been so rude to you, God could get a hold of their life and all of a sudden they'd start being your friend. You probably don't want them to be your friend, but they could be at least nice to you. You have no idea. And you might be married to that person. So you have no <laughs> idea what God, that's the abundant life. That's the, that's the life. And I, Part of the questions, of course, that as a, as a leadership, as a church, we're like, okay, what does this mean? Because here, here it is, folks. Scottsdale Worship Center, man, we've gone through the p pandemic. We've gone through, like, every, people watching online. It, you know, they get people, we, we, get, we get our schedules are real kind of thrown out in the, in the uh, and, and we're like, 
It's so disorienting. Here's what the future does not look like for, and all I can do is speak for our church. It is not about programs. It is not about programs. And, it, and at the end of the day, it really isn't about trying to get as many people as we can to come to church, though we would so anticipate that outcome. Our driving force is about leading people closer to Jesus Christ himself. Like, there's no greater force. Why? Because we don't want them, we're not, we're not loving people so they'll be part of our gig, right? We want people to be part of what you and I have experienced, and that is the, the transforming of Abundant life that we have in Jesus Christ. And man, if we could stay on that point, I think there is a whole world. In fact, I'm told that Phoenix is the fifth least engaged spiritually in the entire nation. And you're like, oh, dear God. I'm like, yes, that's called a mission field. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Like, I don't need to go to Africa. I don't need to go. Like, we need to go to our backyard, right? How many know somebody that's not serving Jesus? And you, because they, they haven't trimmed the tree that hangs over your yard. Obviously, they are not. For my, I've been praying oh for our neighbors. Goodness, it's just the one. I can't believe you brought that Sorry. up. Sorry. I hope they're watching. No, I hope they're not watching. I love you. Um, old First paradigms. You know where old paradigms go? They need to die. Like, we need, we need one paradigm. It's Jesus Christ. Like, and as it's revealed Amen. according to his word, the last thing you need is me to tell you what Jesus would do in any given situation. The best thing we can do is have a craving and a desire. I want it collectively, too. I want to know you, Jesus. I want to know you. Amen. I don't want to wait for my pastor to, to tell me. Amen. 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 Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says this. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness yeah. and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son yeah. in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, right? We have been taken from the pit we could never have extricated ourselves from. That's it. And placed in the kingdom of the Son of God. Where love reigns, right? Yeah. Where holiness rules. <laughs> where God is king. The place of the abundant life that we've been talking about. And then the purpose of the mission. This idea that our lives can have eternal value as we are involved in the activities and the mission and the life of Jesus Christ. And by the way, it's the most joyful life as well. And we were a couple, I think maybe it was last year, we were visiting Joel at his college in Prescott. And one morning early, we were taking a walk, and we were near a golf course. We were kind of walking along the, uh, the pathway. And this is before Winston. So I've been very alert to dogs for a long time. But this dog runs right past us, and it's just this little brown dog. And... She is so full of joy, so happy. Like if joy could be incarnated into a furry little dog, this dog was it. And she was just tearing across this, you know, Leaping beautiful and, grass yeah, yeah. as fast as she could go. And her owner was, you know, a couple feet behind. And all of a sudden he just says, Abby. And she turned so fast, just like 180 and came straight back to him and sat right down at his feet. And of course, she was off leash, like she, she is free range in the world, just going and running. But the minute that her owner called her name, and it wasn't a shout, it was just Abby, and he, she turned and came straight back. And I thought, wow, what a beautiful picture of the joy of obedience, that when we're being led by the Lord, when we're close enough relationally to hear just his quiet word, we can run free range. We can be trusted to go and enjoy life and have a pretty great time because he's right there with us. And we hear him call our name and we come right back and we see up, here I am. What do you want from me? Here I am. That's the kind of life that we're being invited into, this joyful experience of obedience that's completely safe 
because he is there and he is watching and we yield to him yeah. just like that. Yeah. Right? So, you know, usually about this time we're like, okay, let's get the Bible plans out. <laughs> got to read our Bible more. Got to pray more. Got to go to church more. And so we're like, yeah. really quick, we start turning it back to works. And here, here's what we've done in our, in our, our modern day. We like, yeah, that's legalism. I'm free. Puppy dog, right? What if, what if we reorient that? Say, my, my focus, when I open up my Bible... Every day, multiple times of the day, I want to see Jesus. I so want to know Jesus more. I'm going to study his word. I'm going to study the word. Why would I want to pray? I want to felt, but before all the prayers of petition, I want to get to know Jesus more. Fellowship with him. Allow the Holy Spirit to reveal who God is. Why do I want to gather? Why would I make it a priority to gather as a congregation? Because this, y'all, is called the body of Christ. Amen. We're not a church like a business thing. We are the living, breathing body of Christ. And if we want to know Jesus more, we want to worship Jesus, we're going to want to be together with his body. And from that, we're active members that are, that are part of being mobilized to go and accomplish great. Folks, seriously, look around. It is ridiculous how many empty seats are in this room. Now compare that to that video that you saw about 35 minutes ago. How is that possible? Now you add another 50, 60, 75 people like, dog, come on, dog. <laughs> Whoops. Like, what are the possibilities? Like, multiplication. Why? Not because we're, we're like some kind of organizational giant, but because we are on the mission of Jesus Christ to bring His kingdom to earth here and now. In 2023, I'm, I'm like, bring it on. Bring it on. Yeah? Stand with us. We're going to pray with you. Jen's going to lead us in a prayer. Um, Chesterton, uh, G.K. Chesterton, a great writer, uh, author, preacher, and, but wrote this. I love this quote. The more I consider Christianity, it's from early 1900s, um, the more I found that while it established a rule and order, the chief aim of that order was to give room for good things to run wild. And I'm like, what do you think of that, y'all? What do you think about it? Well, think about it for a second. You're like, some of you are like, ah, that sounds like craziness. You know what I think it looks like? It might have looked a lot like what the day of Pentecost looked like. Because they were like, those people been drinking. Those people are a little, little, woo. So I'm like, welcome to Scottsdale Worship Center. We're a little woo. -woo. Yeah. Look around. Look at some of you. Look at your pastor. We're like, why? Because we love Jesus. Because we're committed to being full of the Spirit of God. And we're crying out as a community. Come on, help me cry out. God, come. Move, Lord, among us, God. Move, God, mightily among us, Lord. Holy Spirit, set us on fire. Amen. Amen. Set us on fire, Lord. We sever the Amen. old way of thinking. Old paradigm. Old distracted, stale, smelly, useless programs. We say, Jesus, we want a fresh revival of who you are. We delight in you, Lord, like you delight in us on fire oh lord come on drink it in drink it in take a deep breath Jesus. holy spirit Thank you, holy 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 we worship you we worship Jesus. Jesus. 
message. This is our status. This is who we are. Delivered one. Pastor Jen, lead us in a prayer meditation. Lord Jesus, you are with us. You are within us. Lord, you are before us. You are behind us. You undergird us and hold us up, and you are above us, Lord. We are surrounded by your presence because we are in you. And we thank you, Lord, that that is all the security that we really need, Lord, is is to be in you, to know your greatness, to know your glory, to see your majesty to see your splendor, Lord, to receive your healing touch and your deliverance in our lives, Lord. These are the things, God, that you have promised and have given to us and have delivered through Jesus Christ. We receive you afresh today, Lord, that your spirit would rise up within each believer, Lord, to to cleanse and to heal and to change and to transform, Mm. to love, Lord, to do all of the things that you do so perfectly, Father. We receive you afresh again and again, that we would be filled with your spirit every single day of our lives, Lord. All glory, all praise to the name of Jesus, our deliverer, our conquering king. Amen. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Jesus. Often remind us, altars are available. We're available, elders, pastors. Pray with you. If you're online, let us know how we can be praying. Come alongside of you in your spiritual journey. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do in and through us. Take time. Journal it out. Like God's, how many believe God's just kind of moved on our hearts today? Like, like it's, this is getting good, right? Amen. What's that going to look like? What's your deliverance going to look like? What's being in the kingdom going to look like? Do it a little different. We bless you. Been a joy. Once again, I just want to love on you in this. I, somebody asked, hold on a second. Somebody asked me, why do, you, why do you do this? Like, honestly, other than it's biblical, <laughs> there's that. Um, it's because, honestly, if Jennifer and I could, we would hug every one of you. And this is the closest that I get. So get ready for a hug. I bless you. I love you and bless you in the name of the Lord our God. I bless you with the reality of who Jesus is. I bless you with the transforming power to become more like Jesus. To Him be all the glory in His ecclesia, His church, now and forever. And all the church said, Amen. 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 We love you. God bless you, folks.